this video, we'll be looking at the human ear. We'll look at some of the structure and the functions uh, of the different parts of the human ear. Then we'll look at the two functions that the ear performs. And then lastly, we'll look at some hearing defects. Now, the ear has two functions in our body. The first one is hearing, which is the obvious one. And then the second one is balance. Now we'll look at these two functions in more detail a bit later on in the video. So what we should do first is look at the structure of the ear in general and understand what the individual parts do. So the ear is divided into three regions, the outer ear, the middle ear, and then the inner ear. So the outer ear is the structure that you can see from the outside, and then the middle ear is made up of the tympanic membrane, which is the eardrum, ossicles, which is a collective name for three bones, um, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, and then the round window. And then the inner ear is made up of the oval window, the semicircular canals, which are these loopy structures that you can see over there, and then the cochlea, as well as the auditory nerve that sits over there. Now we'll look at some of the structures and the functions of the ear, taking all three of those regions and putting them together as a whole so you can get a nice bigger picture of what the ear looks like. So starting with the outer ear, it is made up of this area over here. And it is composed of the pinna and the auditory canal, also known as the ear canal. So the pinna's function is to actually direct sound waves towards the eardrum. So sound travels in waves, and as soon as it hits the ear, the pinna is actually made up of yellow cartilage. So these cartilaginous materials actually have folds in them that will help direct sound into the inner ear or towards the eardrum. Next, the, the ear canal will then transfer those sound waves further towards the tympanic membrane which will then uh, convert those sound waves into vibrations and so forth. So that is the end of the outer ear. Now we'll look at the middle ear. Now the middle ear as well as the outer ear are both air-filled areas, whereas the inner ear is a fluid-filled area. And the middle ear is quite pressure sensitive. So the pressure inside the middle ear has to be exactly the same as the pressure on the outside so that there's no weird changes that will occur within the eardrum itself. Because if there's going to be more pressure on the inside, it's going to press against that eardrum and it's going to be very painful. So the one thing that our ears have to compensate for that pressure or to get that pressure stabilized is the eustachian tube. So it's this tube running down here and that tube actually empties out into your throat. So if you've ever driven on a mountain pass and then as you were going up higher and higher you would encounter a point where it would feel like your ears are popping. So if you open up your mouth at that point it would open up that eustachian tube and allow air to rush in to stabilize the air pressure so it is the same in the middle ear as it is on the outer ear. Looking at the rest of the middle ear, so we've looked at the eustachian tube now, the tympanic membrane obviously separates the outer and the middle ear. Then we also have those three little bones known all together as the ossicles and then they are also known as the auditory bones and then individually as the hammer which is this bone over here and then this anvil, which is this bone, little bone over there, and then the stirrup, which is that bone right there. Call the stirrup because obviously if you look at it and if you've ever ridden or gotten close to a horse, then it looks like the stirrup that you would put your foot in. So what happens is as soon as the sound hits the tympanic membrane, those sound waves are converted into vibration. So this tympanic membrane starts to vibrate. And that vibration causes the hammer that sits right against that uh, tympanic membrane to move up and down. 
And because that hammer is now moving, it's in turn going to move the anvil. It's going to hit against the one part of the anvil. So now the anvil is going to move. And then lastly, the anvil that's connected to the stirrup is going to start moving. And then the stirrup finally hits against the oval window, which we'll get to when we get to the inner ear. So let's look at the movement of these three bones looking at this video. If it'll load. So as sound comes in the ear canal, it causes the tympanic membrane to start vibrating. As it vibrates, it's hitting against the hammer. The hammer is in turn hitting against the anvil, and then the anvil hits against the stirrup, and finally against the oval window. So that is how those three bones work together. Let me just close this window quickly. So that is the end of the middle ear. Now we're going to move towards the inner ear, and the inner ear is this region over there. Now the inner ear is fluid filled. So inside these bony pieces there is fluid drifting around and that fluid actually has a very important function, but we'll look at that a bit later on. So the first part that we'll look at is the semicircular canals, which are these three loops that you can see, and the function of those are for balance. And we'll look at that more in depth later in the video. Then the oval window is the one that transmits the vibrations to the fluid filled inner ear after the stirrup hits against it. Though the oval window then generates, it's also a membrane, also generates vibrations that get passed into that fluid that's inside this area. Then the vestibular nerve. You don't really need to know this one, but it is connected to the semicircular canals um, as well as the utricle and the sacculus, but we'll, we, you don't really need to know that. The cochlear nerve is the auditory nerve, so that transmits nerve impulses to the brain that gives rise to the sensation of the hearing. And then the next one is the cochlea, and cochlea actually is Greek. The Greek for it is a snail because it looks like a snail if you look at how that coiled up part looks. And that is a very important part. That's actually where hearing comes from. It contains the organ of corti that converts mechanical stimuli into nerve impulses. Uh, stimuli into nerve impulses, so those nerve impulses then get sent to the brain and we get the sensation of hearing. Then the vestibule, so the vestibule is the utricle and the sacculus um, that also helps with balance. And then the round window which sits over there, it releases pressure from the inner ear. So just looking at this video again, you see as the stirrup is hitting against it, that is the round window over there. Can you see that it also moves as the stirrup is hitting against it? Because as that stirrup is hitting against the oval window, that's creating uh, that fluid on the inside to move. So as that fluid moves, it needs kind of a release of pressure, so something to move with it in order for it to flow efficiently. We've done the tympanic membrane and the eustachian tube, so that is the end of the structures within the ear and now we're going to start looking at the different regions a bit more in depth. Just as a quick recap of the ear again, let's look at the three regions. So obviously you've got the outer ear and then you've got the middle ear which is made up of the tympanic membrane, the eustachian tube and then those three bones known as the, os uh, the ossicles. Uh, also known as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, and then the oval window. These bones, just for interest's sake, all held together by little tiny ligaments. And then the internal ear, which is made up of the oval window, the round window, the semicircular canals, the cochlea, and then the auditory nerve. Now, just so you know, if you the cochlea is actually rolled up, if 
you were to unwind it, it would be one straight tr structure like that, but it actually rolls up onto itself so that you can get those coils. Let's now move on to the functions of the ear, which is balance and hearing. So there are two structures involved with the balance in the ear. The first one is crista, and then the second one is macula. So where would we find these crystals? So they are found at the base of the semicircular canals, so right over here in these bulges that we call ampulla. Now these ampulla contain the crista, which in turn have these receptor cells known as hair cells, which are very sensitive, and they are actually the one that will be converting whatever impulse is generated uh, or, or, sorry, whatever stimulus is generated into an impulse that is sent to the brain. And they get triggered by this jelly-like substance when it moves either direction. It will push the hair cells either to the right or to the left. And we'll look at that when we look at a video in just a small bit, just to see what they do exactly. Then the macula. So the macula are found in the area called the utricle and the saccule, and that's the area over here and there. And let me just show you on the other diagram just so you are clear. Oops. So the utricle would be this area, and the saccule would be just below it. So what does the macula do? Its function is to detect the position of the head in space with respect to gravity. So if you are looking down, it's the macula that tells you that your head is currently looking down and not in its normal position. And then secondly, let me show you the structure of these. So remember, this is now the crista and then this is the macula. Now on top of the macula, we've got what we call autoliths. So they are crystals made of calcium carbonate. And then they also rest on an autolithic membrane, which is also a jelly-like substance that will move around. Now these autoliths are very heavy. So they are able to pull this jelly-like substance in either direction. And then once again, there's also some hair cells that are the receptors that will generate that impulse that is sent to the brain. Let's look at some videos to look at the structures and the functions once again. So this is the macula that is responsible for detecting um, more specifically yeah, the position of your head in space uh, with respect to gravity. So if somebody is going to move their head forward, that is what's going to happen with the macula. Those autoliths, remember they are very heavy, so they'll move down with the downwards movement of the head. And as they are doing that, uh, the gelatinous uh, material, the autolithic membrane, will be pulled with it, and that in turn will pull the hair cells, little hair-like outgrowths with it. And that is going to send a impulse to the brain telling your brain that your head is currently in a downward position. Going back, if you pull your head back, it will do exactly the same thing. And then in a normal position, the autoliths will be in a resting position. So, interesting thing is if you start running very fast, in the beginning, the autoliths will be pulled back, but as soon as you reach a constant speed, those autoliths will remain in the same position unless you stop. Then they'll pull again, and then they'll come to rest. So they don't really get triggered um, with velocity. It's just in the beginning as you are pulling away that that will happen. I think there's one more section of this video I'd like you to see. So they can detect horizontal movement and detect where your body is in position with regards to gravity with horizontal movement, but then also vertical movement. 
So if somebody is going to jump up and down, there are autoliths, I think they are in the saccule, that will also move down and send that impulse to your brain to tell you that you have just jumped. Next, we'll be looking at the crystal found in the semicircular canals. Actually, before I show you this video, let me just explain something to you. So these semicircular canals, if we look at this picture on the left, so can you see that they all point in different directions? Now, they are actually pointing at right angles of each other. So they are pointing in different directions that your head could possibly turn at. So if we look at it like this, so let's say that is you from the front and that is you from the side. So what actually is happening is that these um, semicircular canals are there for your head tilting in a specific direction. So let's say the first one is from the front of your head to the back of your head. And that is known as the x-axis. So one of these semicircular canals will be able to move in that direction. Then the other one, let's say, moves from your left ear to your right ear. Okay, so this is obviously different than from the front of your nose to the back of your head. It's now from your left ear to your right ear. And let's say that movement is the y-axis. And then lastly, a movement that is from the top to bottom and we'll name that the z-axis. So these semicircular canals will be able to move in any one of these directions and there's a fluid inside of them called the endolymph fluid. Now that fluid will move in the opposite direction of the way that your head is moving. So let's say you're moving your head down, that fluid will rush up and what it then does is it comes into contact in the ampulla with those crista and it forces um, that jelly-like substance to move into a certain direction, pulling it. And then because of that, it will then, let me just get a different color, it will trigger these hair cells. So the hair cells will either be pulled down um, to the left or down to the right. But let's quickly look at that video. So hopefully it will make a bit more sense. So if you tilt your head from your left ear to your right ear, you see the movement of the fluid, it goes the opposite direction. Then you get the one where you can move your head forwards and backwards. Once again, look at the fluid motion. It goes opposite to the way that you are moving. And then lastly, side to side. See the fluid moving. Okay, so that is the endolymph fluid and that is where the semicircular canals come in handy. Let's look at a following video. So remember in the ampulla, those thickened areas, let me take it back a bit. So those thickenings at the end called the ampulla, inside them are the crista and then this is what the crista looks like. So you've got the thickening and inside that is the fluid called the endolymph. Then you've got that jelly-like a uh, so, uh, layer and inside the jelly like layer you've got those hair cells so let's look at what will happen if there's movement once again there's the fluid the endolymph fluid so let's say you're turning your head the endolymph fluid moves that jelly-like layer and that in turn triggers the hair cells to move in a specific way. Okay. Let's move on to hearing. So the sense of sound is generated in the cochlea. So that is this little coiled structure over here, which is that snail-like looking thing that we were mentioning before. So 
the cochlea has three canals. It has the scala vestibuli, which is the upper canal. So if we look at this lower diagram, it's this one over here. And then it has the scala media, which is the middle canal, the one that runs here in the middle with a bit of yellow. And then lastly, the scala tympani, which is the lower canal that sits down there. Now remember I mentioned earlier that the cochlea is actually an elongated structure that is just coiled up on itself. Now inside the cochlea we have the organs of corti that contain hair cells that are found in the scala media, so in the middle one. They are responsible to detect vibrations coming from the ossicles and convert them to nerve impulses. So remember as sound waves are hitting the tympanic membrane, the tympanic membrane starts to vibrate and that causes movement of the hammer. The hammer in turn causes movement of the anvil and then the anvil of the stirrup. The stirrup then hits against the oval window. Now that oval window is also starting to vibrate and that oval window will cause waves um, in the fluid because this area the cochlea itself is filled with fluid as well and it will cause that fluid to start moving. Now as that fluid starts moving it's going to trigger the basilar membrane that's in the, the scala media as well as the hair cells that are attached to that to also start moving and different frequencies will be triggered at different spots in this section. Let me just go down to this diagram which I, let me see, there we go. Okay, so looking at this diagram we've got the scala vestibuli, the scala tympani at the bottom and then the scala, uh, scala media. Now in it there's a basilar membrane that runs all along the bottom and attached to that is also the hair cells. Now once again those hair cells are receptors. Now on this diagram it shows you that high frequencies are mostly heard in this first section and then lower frequencies, so somebody with a very deep voice, is heard at this um, end region. So sound waves are generated because of different frequencies. Now how are we able to hear those different frequencies? Because they will be stimulated or triggered um, by these hair cells detecting them by the way of the movement of these waves coming in the sound waves. And then those vibrations will trigger the hair cells and those receptors will pick up that it's either being detected on the lower frequency range or at the high frequency range down here. I know it sounds a little bit complicated, but as long as you know that the hair cells and so forth are in the organ of Corti with that basilar membrane, and it is these hair cells that get have the receptors in them that then will get stimulated, and that stimulus is then generated as an impulse that will go out the auditory nerve towards the brain. So as soon as one of these hair cells gets triggered, let's say this one is closer um, to the round window, that will then be the higher frequencies and let's say one of these is at the end, so this will be a lower frequency that is picked up. So let's say it's a very low frequency that will travel and it will stimulate this hair cell. And once again, remember I was speaking about the round window that is there for pressure release, so there's the round window. As this fluid moves through and generates these waves, it has to have somewhere that will let it move a bit. So that is the round window that will help with that pressure release. So in the end, your hearing depends on these tiny little hair cells and whether they can pick up a stimulus or not. Remember, humans can only hear at a, a certain frequency. Animals like dogs can hear at a much higher frequency. So they've got hair cells that are very sensitive to that area, for example. Now we'll go on to some hearing defects. 
The first urine defect that we'll look at is middle ear infection, and you'll see in just a bit why this is classified as a urine defect. So middle ear infections are generally caused by a viral infection, such as a flu or a cold, and this causes a fluid buildup in the middle ear. Now, if you remember early on in the video, I told you that the middle ear is an air-filled region, so there shouldn't be any fluid there. So if somebody with middle ear infection, they will have a severe fluid buildup. And this actually causes these ossicles not to move as efficiently as they should, which means that they're not amplifying sound as they should. And if you've ever had a middle ear infection, which I'm sure most of you have had during your life, you'll know that sounds are very muffled and that you struggle to hear people talk. Now, the bad thing with middle ear infections is if they get very severe, the fluid just keeps on building up and building up and that starts pushing up against the tympanic membrane, which causes ear pain. And that is because the tympanic membrane starts to push out and it shouldn't be doing that. The fluid also keeps building up because the eustachian tube is not draining the fluid as it should because the eustachian tube in many cases also gets swollen shut so or filled with that fluid so that is really bad that the fluid cannot get drained but don't worry there is a solution you can either take antibiotics if it's a bacterial infection pain medication to get that ear pain out of the way and in severe cases grommets are in place uh, or sorry are placed into the ear and this is generally done in younger children so grommets are these little tube like structures and they're very tiny as you can see. So an incision is made into the ear, uh, the, the eardrum, and then the grommet is placed inside. And what that does, it actually allows fluid, the fluid that has been built up in that middle ear for very long, to drain out into the outer ear. And when all of that fluid is finally drained, usually it takes quite a while for that to happen, the grommet is then taken out again, and the, the eardrum will heal as it was before. Next we'll look at deafness. So there's two types of deafness. You get conductive deafness, which is generally temporary, and then you get neural deafness, which is a bit more permanent. So conductive deafness usually occurs in the outer ear and to a certain extent in the middle ear and then neural deafness is completely in the inner ear. Now conductive deafness is, one or, is when one or more mechanisms of the ear don't function properly, such as the ossicles. Let's say those ossicles aren't um, moving as efficiently as they should, so they're not amplifying that sound, so that would be conductive deafness. Or let's say that there's a large buildup of wax against the eardrum, so that would also be a form of conductive deafness, but that is temporary because the earwax can be removed. Um, it can also be fixed with medication or surgery, or in the case of the ossicles not functioning as properly, you can fix that with hearing aids. Neural deafness is a bit more serious. So this is when there is damage that has to be damaged, damage, sorry, damage to sensory cells, the auditory nerve, or even the brain. And the causes of this is age. So people generally have a decline um, in their hearing with age as they get older, older. Head injuries, this can cause neural deafness. So if you've hit your head or been in a car accident or fell from a very high height and you've had a head injury, that can cause neural deafness. Extreme noise exposure, this is also um, can cause neural deafness uh, when people are in workshops where there's constant hammering or loud machinery being used, such as grinders, or people operating large machinery at mines, driving these massive vehicles that are very noisy. It can also be inherited, and then with conductive deafness, a wax accumulation against the tympanic membrane. So how can these be treated? So they can be treated with hearing aids that amplify sounds in the, f in the case of conductive deafness. Now hearing aids these days come in all shapes and sizes. Modern hearing aids these days, you won't even be able to see them. I mean, they are very concealed. 
then you get something called a cochlear implant and this is an electronic device that is surgically inserted so this requires surgery and it is a bit more serious now what these cochlear implants do is they convert sound into electrical impulses that is sent to the brain through the auditory nerve so you'll see that it is a much larger contraption as well there's a transmitter that you can see over there and then on the inside they have a receiver and a stimulator and then there's also electrodes built into the cochlea that will help send these electrical impulses to the auditory nerve. So that is the end of this video. Mm -hmm.